So, uh, last time we got through 6.2, so I'm going to start with 6.3, and we're still going to have to skip some stuff. This is a long chapter. There are 808 slides, I think, in here. Um, but that's okay. But there are a few more things we need to get uh, familiar with tonight. And I think once we get familiar with these, we'll be okay. Um, the most important modeling um, tool or, or scheme is object-oriented. And we hear that a lot today. But what does it mean to be object-oriented? Well, object-oriented means that we can consider, for instance, snippets of code as objects. And we can actually reuse those objects for different purposes. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, and it's important to us because the other physical way that we program today is in modules. And oftentimes an object, one object is one module or one module is one object. That is the most, um, uh, most usable form of an object is when it's uh, one module per one object, okay? But it can't always be done that way. So, um, so what that does is it decomposes the system into a collection. And this is a collection of modules. This module feeds this module, feeds this module, etc. Okay? Um, and there are ways to, to look at those. Each one is uniquely identifiable. Um, it's a target of a message or request. So for instance, we may send a message to a module which changes the way the module operates, but it's something we need. We may need a part, for instance, from inventory. So we need to know the part and the price. But we may want to say we need 15 of these and we want the module to come back with the price of 15. Pretty easy, right? Product, the part price times 15. Okay, so that's a simple case. Um, now, the variables that we feed into the object may themselves be objects. Why is that? Well, we may have a variable that's kind of uh, universal and can be modified as to what it is. So, for instance, if we had an uh, object that takes units times price and comes back with total price, right? It could be parts times unit part price, or it could be gallons of gasoline times price per gallon, or it could be something like the charge for a parking uh, spot times the number of hours. So notice the object's the same, but what we fed it is different. And so that's the idea of messaging. Um, and of course that has to do with reuse too. Now there's two forms of reuse. One is by inheritance, we're going to talk about that more. And the other um, thing we need to consider is uh, using it as a polymorphic. And what I just described with, to you is an example of polymorphic. Using it for parking, using it for gallons of gas, or using it for parts. And we're going to use an example there of a service station to take a look at how all that works. <coughs> so, looking at it in terms of software, we talk about classes. Um, and a class in software implements an abstract data type. So we look at, within a class, if you've programmed already in Java or C, you know, you define classes, right? And within those classes, you're talking about a distinct uh, situation, I guess is the best way to say it. And so within that, you've got distinct data types for that particular class. Um, let's see. Um, so instance variables are the variables that have an instance within this program, and uh, they refer then to objects. So, how's that going to work? 
These are just terminologies right now. So a system then is a set of objects. Well, we've kind of discussed that in terms of modules. Um, the object's data are called its attributes. And the operations, what it actually does to that data, is called its methods. Uh, they could have multiple interfaces. We we're talking about this last time. Depending on where it comes from or where it goes to, it could have multiple and different interfaces. If the clerk behind the counter in your pizza parlor is looking at uh, pricing at a pizza, that may be different in the way it treats inventory than if the manager is going in and looking at inventory because they may want to know uh, use this month, amount on hand, what's a projected order rate, other things in that interface that the clerk behind the counter didn't need to see. Okay. So, sale uh, could be an instance of an object. Within that, though, we talk about subtotals, tax, and total. Those are all money variables. Um, what can we do with those, some of the methods? We can add an item, remove an item. Compute a subtotal, compute a tax, compute a total, and void a sale. So these are methods, those are actual variables. Okay? Um, we may need to reference a date. So we've got day, month, year, and how it's going to be uh, set up. We may also want to be able to look at actual items what my product number, name, description, price, which is a money variable. Okay. And those then would come over to here. So, variables can refer to objects of different classes. And we'll take a look at how that works. We may go across classes in the course of the program's execution. We call that dynamic binding. Um, we're going to show directed arrows in our diagrams to depict how the relationship goes. What's the, what is feeding what, for instance. Okay. Um, and at the end of the arrows, we're going to talk about multiplicity. So if we're talking about an invoice, for instance, an invoice may have multiple line items, right? Or multiple inventory items that it's picking. So that's going to be a one for n, for meaning multiple. Okay? And we're going to see that in the diagrams. So here's a diagram. So, we have a runtime entity, here's the object, uh, it's an instance of a class, and there's one object for the class, it implements an interface, and it has an instance variable with references to the object, but also is a type of interface. Below the interface we have subtypes, 0 to 1, so it's either none or 1. Um, subclasses of class, again, 0 to 1. So it's either no subclass or one subclass. Okay. Now, if we take classes and combine them to come up with a component class, we call that object composition. We're building on, on uh, multiple objects or different classes. Um, or we can take a class and extend it by modifying the definitions to be more useful using subclasses, and we call that inheritance. 
And I, we've got a diagram that will better describe how that works. So composition and inheritance are the two versions. Here's an example of inheritance. So what we had previously set up was a uh, object called sale, which dealt with subtotal tax and money, and it had all of these methods, and it referred to date, and it brought in items for here. So this was a sale, like a retail sale. We added to that, we inherited from that, a more robust system, which then dealt with bulk sales as well. So up here, don't look at this right now, up here was what we originally built. We inherited everything from that to create also bulk sales. So we didn't reinvent the wheel, basically. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. So, we talked about polymorphism earlier. It has to do with what data are we calling and can we use different data in the same object, such as gallons versus parts versus parking hours. So one of the decisions we need to make in our design is how we're going to use the objects, how we, what objects do we need, and how are we going to have them interact one to another. And are we going to use inheritance or composition, and how are we going to use those? Um, so a new class can be created by extending and overriding behavior of an existing class. That's inheritance, and that's what we showed up here with the bulk sales. Or it can be created by combining simpler classes to form a more complex class, and we call that composite class. And again, we're going to see that better in the diagram. So let's just move ahead. Here we go. So we can take all of, we can describe what an engineer is and what an engineer does, right? But we can add to that and make it more specific to what a software engineer does. Okay, so software engineer is an inheritance of everything an engineer does, plus they're dealing with software. It's more specific. Um, or we could take and say, well, software engineer has engineering capabilities brought in by engineering and more stuff in there. So we're really using composition here, where we're using inheritance here. Does that make sense? They're related, they're very close, and they get to the same end point, but there are times when one is better than the other. So let's go back here. Um, composition is better than inheritance at preserving the encapsulation of the reused code. So. In the composition, we don't have to change the code because a composite object accesses the component only through its advertised interface. It's done through the interface. Uh, by contrast, inheritance, uh, the subclass's implementation is determined at design time and is static. This is another problem. Inheritance is good if you design it from the beginning because it's static. Whatever you said it is, that's what it is. Up here in composition, we can actually say, well, let's make that kind of like a black box and whatever we feed it, here's what it does. But later on, we may come up with a new requirement from the customer. But we say, well, wait a minute, that still works with a unit times its price, right? So we'll feed that new information into that same black box and get out what we needed. And that's composition. Um, so the resulting objects are less flexible than objects inst uh, <laughs> instantiated or initiated, I think it's a better word, from component, component class. Component classes 
are uh, more flexible because you can use them later in things that you hadn't thought about. Whereas inheritance is something that is designed from the beginning. It's more, it's less flexible. Um, now the greatest advantage of inheritance is the ability to change and specialize behaviors of inherited methods by selectively overriding inherited functions or definitions. But you have to do that at the beginning in the design phase. So here's that same picture again. This is inheritance over here. So I take, I want software engineering, but I'm going to inherit everything from engineering and change what's necessary to make it software engineering at design stage. Over here, I'm going to take what's known about engineering and through the interface from there, bring it over into software engineering. Or I could just as likely bring it over into some other uh, discipline because I've used compo composite. I've not changed what's in engineering. I haven't modified it at all. But in inheritance, I may have had to modify something. So, and here's where I want to start skipping some graphs or we'll never make it through. off of what we had there. Um, all right, UML, Unified Modeling Language is what that's called. And you have a exercise in your project to do a UML diagram. So we want to talk about UML. UML is just saying they've come up with standards on how to do the diagrams based on UML protocol, for, for instance. Um, and that way that when you put it in your documentation, somebody else can read your diagrams because it's a standard format. So it's a format for putting together diagrams. And some of those that we were looking at were done with UML. Uh, so where is it useful? The use case diagram, that's one of the ones that uh, you, you're going to use, that's the, that's the one where you show the flow from the manager signing into your system. Where does the system flow for the manager? From the clerk signing into the system, which modules does the clerk see? And it may share, the clerk may share modules that the manager sees. So it's in the same diagram. The customer, if you allow the customer, for instance, some of the people have done this project in the past, and said, well, what about a customer who wants to sign in using the web from home and order their pizza? Well, then they've got to see the system, but that's going to see something different than the clerk sees, for instance, because the customer may be able to get in and change their credit card number, but you don't want the clerk on the counter seeing details of a credit card number. So, um, that is the use case. Use meaning the different users interfacing with the system. And a user can be a person, but it may be another system, actually. Um, the UML activity diagrams, domain models, these are just the different diagrams that we can use UML to uh, do the diagram. So here is uh, UML being used in the development process. And here's three areas we've talked about. Requirements, that's where we're taking the, we're, we're actually going out and interviewing for the requirements. We are then designing, uh, well not designing, but we're organizing and sorting like requirements, right? Together. Um, we may want to use some UML case diagrams here just because as we talk to different people in the organization, we're already beginning to get 
how they're going to use things. So we may want to start playing with that in different scenarios and activity diagrams. When we get to the actual architecture, though, we're thinking code. So how are we going to actually program this? So what about our UML diagrams using components, meaning could be modules? Uh, and how are we going to deploy this? Deployment might include, uh, we are, can't get the whole thing done in the first release, so we're going to deploy this in stages. Okay, so much in the first release, so much in the second release. And then actually getting down to the actual design of the system in detail. So architecture is like uh, a 20,000 foot look at the system. Some people have an overview. This is detail design. Okay? But we can still use UML diagrams to show what we're talking about. So here's a case, and it's going to use what I was talking about earlier. We've got Royal Service Station. Right? And the service station does a number of different things. Um, and these come under the requirements. So it provides three types of services. The three types of services is gasoline, maintenance, where it actually does repair, and parking. It it's, has parking requirements. Um, they want to control the inventory. They want to track credit history. Obviously, if you have a customer who didn't pay the bills, you want to know. Or you may want to keep track of the uh, credit card they've used in the past so they can just say, use what I've done in the past. Uh, they want to know about payments that are overdue, obviously. Um, they want to use data requirements interfacing with other systems. So they may have prior systems or vendor systems where they want to be able to send out reorders automatically from the system. So they've got to interface with their vendors. Uh, record tax and related information. Uh, review the tax records because what? They've got to consolidate sales tax and pay one sales tax per month or per quarter depending on the state. Um, you want to send periodic messages to customers. Uh, I use Christian Brothers up in Woodstock, and boy, are they good at social media. Right, and I get messages for special prices on oil changes, or you haven't been in since, you may want to come in for whatever. But they're an extremely honest group, and I'm, I'm happy to have them do that. Um, Customer can rent parking space in the station parking lot. So there's the parking space uh, object. Um, it needs to have a repository for account information. When I call in and say I want to bring in one of my cars, I just mention which car. If it's the Miata, then they know exactly what the last service was I did on the Miata. If it's the van, they know about that. If it's my wife's car, they know about that. Um, What about the station manager, though? The manager wants to look at managing information, which might be accounting. How much money are we making? What's our profit margin? Do you want everybody in the station knowing about profit margin? So when they start asking for higher wages, right? You're not supposed to make profit. Uh, you can analyze prices and discounts. Are we really making money on oil changes? Um, what if you haven't seen a customer in nine months? That's a dormant account. Could be. You define what dormant is. You may want to uh, send them out a message or an email or a social media contact. Um, and the system cannot be unavailable for more than 24 hours. That's always an uptime requirement. 24 hours is a long time, but um, a lot of people require uptime 
better than 99.9% today's world, that's not, not bad, you know, that's one-tenth or one-percent downtime, right? Normally it's because the web is down. And that's probably not a bad requirement. I can remember when it was 95% uptime. Um, and the system must protect customer information from unauthorized access, like hacking, or just an employee looking at the wrong stuff. So, how do we take that requirements? What do we do? Well, we can start putting in UML class diagrams describing the object types and their static relationships. Um, we want to look at the associations between objects. Um, we want to look at the attributes of each object. So if we're looking at a part, what do we need to know about the part? Well, some of the attributes of the part are the price per, right? We may want to know, for management purposes, the cost per. We may also want to know, and they don't show that here, but knowing something about this kind of business, they know um, what's the average man hours it takes to replace this part, don't they? Because that's how they estimate. So if you go in and say, I think I need to replace the brakes on the front of my car, they need to estimate not only the cost of the parts, but they know how long it should take on average to replace the brakes on the front of your car. So that may be one of the attributes that we uh, put in per part. Um, what do we need to know? We need to know who the actors are in each case. These may be the people who have access to the use case diagram. Uh, what are the physical objects, places, organizations, records, trains? All these things could have impact on each um, object. So here is a use case diagram. Now, something's missing. Anybody tell me what's missing off this picture? I think it's a mistake on the slide. Let me show you something in a minute. Anybody see what's missing? Shouldn't there be something right here? Where are these lines coming from? Well, it turns out that on slide 93, just so you know that I looked at all the slides, slide 93, this slide is repeated with manager sitting here. Okay. I'm not going to go all the way to slide 93 because I don't want to find my way back. But anyway. So manager would be here. Um, so anyway, so what does the customer see? Well, the customer sees three things that they can ask for, fuel services, parking services, and maintenance services. And within those objects, these are objects, there are things that happen, right? If I go for fuel services, well, it's going to go out and find, uh, it's going to first of all record the gallons that I've used. And then it goes out and gets the price per gallon, and then it comes back and gives me a total plus tax, plus total after tax, right? Including tax. Um, and same thing for parking services, hours that I parked times rate per hour. And maintenance services are the parts that I bought, the man hours it took to put it on, and tax and so forth. And notice that these three things can use the same object. So that's the polymorphism. Because they're all taking a thing times a unit price to give a total. So when you look at that, that can all be done with the same uh, object. Now the manager who needs to control inventory needs to look at the ports, parts ordering system. So this may be external interface to an existing system. We may have an external interface to the fuel ordering system. A lot of times these are supplied by vendors. Um, also, the manager needs to go in to see the accounting systems. Um, how much money did we make this month? What are our expenses this month? 
what's our balance sheet look like? So looking at this with this pertaining to the project and us making a UI of the whole situation, um, how how in depth do we have to take this? Do we have to take it to a point where you're saying, okay, quality control? So say like if this person orders a pizza and they want meatballs, but mm -hmm. we're out of meatballs. You know, do we kick back? Can't order this right now because of blah blah blah, and it does an inventory control basically on their system. Do we have to do that? Well, now here's what. Uh, well, I guess you're asking me now because I'm the owner of the pizza parlor, right? Okay. Yes. <laughs> but here's the here's what uh, here's what I recommend when you're talking to your group. Is say, can we run this pizza parlor without this function? The answer is no, you can't. Um, so, in some of these instances, you can make up the answer. I'm not going to dock you for that. I'm looking for creativity, right? So, you may want to say, and because you're building a prototype, by the way, this does happen. There are questions that you didn't get out of the requirements, but you're in depth of developing something, and you've got to go back next Wednesday and show a prototype. So, you may want to say, well, let's assume that this needs to happen. And when we go back with our prototype, the customer will tell us that's not the way they want it. Right. Okay? And since you're just doing a prototype for this project, that's fine. Okay. okay? Um, and the way that I grade it is I'm really grading it on, did you think it through? And do you really have a design that's all there? Pretty much all there. So I described something a few minutes ago that you may or may not do because I don't think it's in the requirements of the project, and that's the customer view. But I've had students who say, well, wait a minute, we ought to do that. So that's that kind of assuming thing. Now what would happen in the real world if you had something like that? Well, the customer, if they had not given you that in the requirements, might say, hey, that is really neat that will put me different from my competitors. How much is it going to cost me? Right? That's why you're happy you did it in a prototype and not finished code, right? Uh, because when you tell them, well, here's your hosting service costs, because you have to host it, right, on the internet. Uh, here is the added cost that we probably have to put together to build that website, website and the web activity because it is an e-commerce site, basically. Um, and the customer say, great, do it. That'll pay for itself. But he also may say, well, that's a little bit steep for us right now. That may be a case for incremental programming. So let's do this for six, nine months, and then I may come back to you and have you add that. So then that says, because of reuse, you may design your system differently and say, well, this module I want to make flexible enough that if it's, we do the customer thing later, I can reuse this code. Okay? So, um, notice the printer system is there, accounting systems, services, Normally, accounting systems are hard to really look at on a screen, especially if your P&L is a long one. So you want to print it out and look at it. And you might have a budget versus actual. You may have um, this year versus last year, this month versus last month. So you can see trends. Uh, the billing services, uh, this is mainly, I think, this one's set up, well, it's for any of them, but one of the things it has to have is a time because of the parking. Okay? So if they're billing for parking, they need to be able to see the time. And here, we may have a credit card system so that we can do billing through the customer's credit card. So that is a UML class diagram, or a user class diagram is how we expressed it, I think, in the uh, project. Okay. I'm going to skip that one. 
keep this one because it's better shown later. These are all things that are within UML. Now, here we go. So here is a UML diagram. And we have entities, for instance, here's a customer, but what are the properties of customer? Name, address, birth date is what they're showing. Okay. Attributes. Um, maintenance reminder, well, that's a text. So we may have comments that are pre-stored for people who should come in for an oil change. So one of the comments that will be sent as a messaging sent will be, you're overdue for an oil change. Come on in and, or let us know and set up an appointment. Um, bill overdue could be something nice that says, in case you miss this, you have missed last month, I'm sure you didn't mean to, type of thing. First time through, anyway. And a dormancy warning. We haven't seen you in nine months. Are you still interested in being on our files and receiving our messages? Okay. Uh, the account um, has an account number, a balance, and a dormant, which is one or zero, bullion. Now, those are the attributes, but here are the methods, as we called them in the previous screen. What did we do with accounts? We can suspend them and reactivate them, uh, put in a bill reminder, that's a person, the accounts are people, accounts, or a dormancy warning. Now, we can tie accounts to purchasing so last date, discount, subtotal, tax rate, tax and total, and we can compute taxes and we can compute totals. Okay. Now, there are three different things we do though. We do vehicle maintenance, we sell fuel, and we do parking. So how does that tie into all of this? Well, if it's vehicle maintenance, we have labor, price, or, or an and, we have the parts, part numbers, price, current quantity, Order trigger. When this part gets down to two, we want to trigger a reorder. <coughs> and then we have a method down here, which is order part. So these are attributes. These are things about the part, and there'll be fields in the record. Is basically what there. This is what this bond, what this uh, object can do to parts. It can order. In fuel, price per gallon, gallons, current quantity, order trigger is 100 gallons. I think that's kind of low. Probably 1,000 gallons would be better. Mm -hmm. But at any rate, um, price per gallon, or can price, I'm sorry, it can price the, uh, the uh, amount of gallons we bought, and it can order fuel. So those are methods. And again, parking, available spaces, daily rate, weekly rate, monthly rate, duration, and then the method is it can price out what we used. Okay? And you can see how all of this works. Does that make sense to you? That is a good UML diagram. So I've been getting a lot of emails from people on how do we put together a UML diagram. There's one right there. And you've got this slide set. I'm going to pull that up. So just remember, there are three things. There's the name of the uh, object itself. There's the uh, data we store on it, which are the attributes. And there are the methods that that object can perform. Okay, so that's software, that's data, and the object is the whole thing. Okay. Make sense? This is more just codes of what those things mean. I'm not going to go into that in detail. Um, these are other UML diagrams. Again, not real. Let's go in that one. I think. Well, 
here's a more detailed version of what we just did. So what happens is, as you begin to build your package or build, build your design, you look at your UML diagram and you say, wait a minute, we need to put more information in. So for instance, um, let's see, here's more information on, well, if this information was in there, but now it's feeding something called inventory, right? So that's an inventory package we're gonna add. Uh, we also have messaging. Um, credit cards, I can't remember if that was in the previous one or not. But this is now adding a few more uh, views of it with interfaces, right? And maybe the code that does updating can be in a reusable module, one of those polymorphisms, where it is we feed it the object we're updating what we're updating within the object as variables in the input to that module. And then that module is flexible enough to go out to the database and do the updates on that metadata, or referring to that metadata. Here's the final cut, has even more. Um, and this is another simplified version of reusing some of those parts and how things feed each other. So here is how a customer interacts with a system. Let's say he's fueling his car, refueling. So he goes over and it verifies his credit card number and the amount because he may go beyond his, his limit, right? Um, is this a new purchase? In, case, in which case we need his account date, refill gallons. Um, now, the, but when we go over to the credit card system to send this information to the credit card supplier, to find out if this is valid and if he's got enough credit limit. Uh, if it's new purchasing, we may want to go over to the purchase account and uh, say this is new fuel, account date, and gallons, and maybe setting up an account, I'm not sure. Uh, update gallons, you've got to update the gallons because you use some, and it goes out to the refuel, but then it comes back to the service station itself with that information on what he used, what the cost was, etc. And it's ready for billing. That's how I read that chart. Here's how parking might work. Now this talks about the different states an object can take, and this is where we were talking about uh, polymorphism or a particular object that can perform more than one uh, function depending on what we feed it in the interfacing. So we can feed it different variables and it does different things. So we could have one module, for instance, that does all the billing, whether it be parking, service, or gasoline. case of that. All right here is something probably all of you have seen. It's probably it's similar to a flow chart. Okay. So here we have some kind of activity A, which feeds activity B, which looks at some decision. Based on the decision, it may just put an output, or it may come down and do activity C or activity D and come down to an end down here. So depending on what those activities produce tells you which way it goes. So 
It's a flow diagram. So here is an actual one with filled in with real things. So verifying stock, well, what can we do? If it's fuel, we want to verify fuel stock. How much gasoline do we have in the tanks? If necessary, we need to order fuel, and we finish this application. On the other hand, we may want to verify parts stock. If necessary, we want to order parts. However, if we look at gas and its verification says we're okay, we have plenty, then we go to a decision and finish. We don't order fuel. If the part stock is okay, then you go to a decision and you come down and you're done. Okay. So it's a fairly simple diagram, but it shows how things might flow. really as far as I want to go tonight. Um, you should read through this, but hopefully I've given you enough to understand it as you read it. That's really what I wanted to do. This is only slide 79 of 108. So we don't have time to to go through all of it. But did this help a little bit in understanding what UML is all about and what objects are all about? Okay, Objects are multiple things. In fact, when you look at objects within databases, you can have a cell in a database which is a bunch of code. You can have a picture. You can have uh, music. You can have all kinds of things which are objects. Objects are just things. Okay. So, any questions? Most of the time, you don't see people write these things out anymore. Um, most of the time, you just see them especially if it's a database, they just print out the database schema. So, are we just learning this for the practical overall how a database looks? Well, this is the application end of it before there even is a database. So, uh, we're looking at it from the standpoint of a customer has come to us and said, I need a brand new application, never been in existence before. How do we even design it before we even start programming it? That's, that's the part I would skip because I'm a developer. Yeah, right, right, right. Okay. But you want to be a software engineer, right? Right. It's what you want to do when you grow up. That's what's important. I could say that to anybody because I'm older than you. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I, I hoped you would see the analogy there. Yeah, it's where are we going? And you're right to always look at it from where you are now. Right. Because what you're seeing is what's different from what I do now. Right. And that's how you learn. So that's it's excellent. Okay. All right. Do we have enough people from a team here to talk to each other? Most of you are from the same team. <laughs> yeah. Good. Uh, I have no team members today. Hmm? I have no team members today. You don't have any members today? Well, let me take your name down and I'll fail the others. Wow. <laughs> actually, actually, why don't you sit in on their discussions? Because you may hear some things that you want to take to the team. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. But don't tell them anything your team's doing. That's not fair. No. Participate in any way you can. So, so I sent over the document right. that I had. Only misunderstanding what? No, 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 no. Your document to me? Yeah. Um, As a beginning. Yeah. Um, right.